Chapter 52 Ajihad Aragon entered an elegant, two-story study paneled with rows of cedar bookshelves. A wrought iron staircase wound up to the small balcony with two chairs and a reading table. White lanterns hung on the walls and ceilings so a book could be read anywhere in the room. The stone floor was covered by an intricate oval rug. At the far end of the room, a man stood behind a large walnut desk. His skin gleamed the color of oiled ebony. The dome of his head was shaved bare, but a closely trimmed black beard covered his chin and upper lip. Strong features shadowed his face, and grave, intelligent eyes lurked under his brow. His shoulders were broad and powerful, emphasized by a tapered red vest embroidered with gold thread and clasped over a rich purple shirt. He bore himself with great dignity, exuding an intense, commanding air. When he spoke, his voice was strong and confident. Welcome to Trojanheim, Aragon and Sephira. I am Ajihad. Please, sit yourselves. Aragon slipped into an armchair next to Murtag while Sephira settled protectively behind them. Ajihaz raised his hand and snapped his fingers. A man stepped out from behind the staircase. He was identical to the bald man beside him. Aragon stared at the two of them with surprise, and Murtag stiffened. Your confusion is understandable. They are twin brothers, said Ajihad with a small smile. I would tell you their names, but they have none. Safir hissed with distaste. Ajihad watched her for a moment, and then sat in his high back chair behind the desk. The twins retreated to under the stairs and stood impassively beside each other. Ajihad pressed his fingers together as he stared at Aragon and Murtag. He studied them for a long time with an unwavering gaze. Aragon squirmed uncomfortable. After what seemed like several minutes, Ajihad lowered his hands and beckoned to the twins. One of them hurried to his side. Ajihad whispered in his ear. The bald man suddenly paled and shook his head vigorously. Ajihad frowned, then nodded as if something had been confirmed. He looked at Murtag. You have placed me in a difficult position by refusing to be examined. You have been allowed into Father and Duel because the twins have assured me that they can control you, and because of your actions on behalf of Aragon and Arya. I understand that there are many things you wish to keep hidden in your mind, but as long as you do, we cannot trust you. You wouldn't trust me anyway, said Murtag defiantly. Ajihad's face darkened as Murtag spoke, and his eyes flashed dangerously. Though, it's been twenty and three years since it last broke upon my ear. I know that voice. He stood ominously, chest swelling. The twins looked alarmed and put their heads together, whispering frantically. It came from another man, one more beast than human. Get up. Murtag warily complied, his eyes darting between the twins and Ajihad. Remove your shirt, ordered Ajihad. With a shrug, Murtag pulled off his tunic. Now turn around. As he pivoted to the side, light fell upon the scar on his back. Murtag, breathed Ajihad. A grunt of surprise came from Oryk without warning. Ajihad turned on the twins and thundered. Did you know of this? The twins bowed their head. We discovered his name in Aragon's mind, but we did not suspect the boy was... The son of one as powerful as Morzan. It never occurred. And you didn't tell me? Demanded Ajihad. He raised a hand, forestalling their explanation. We will discuss it later. He faced Murtag again. For I must untangle this muddle. Do you still refuse to be probed? Yes, said Murtag sharply. Slipped back into his tunic. I won't let anyone inside my head. Ajihad leaned on his desk. There will be unpleasant consequences if you don't. Unless the twins can certify that you aren't a threat, we cannot give you credence, despite, and perhaps because of, the assistance you have given Aragon. Without that verification, the people here, dwarf and human alike, will tear you apart if they learn of your presence. I'll be forced to keep you confined at all times, as much for your protection as ours. It will only get worse once the dwarf king Hrothgar demands custody of you. Don't force yourself into that situation when you can be easily avoided. Murtag shook his head stubbornly. No. Even if I were to submit, I would still be treated like a leper and an outcast. All I wish is to leave. If you'd let me do that peacefully, I'll never reveal your location to the Empire. What happens if you are captured and brought before Galbatorix? Demanded Ajihad. He will extract every secret from your mind, no matter how strong you may be. Even if you could resist him, how can we trust that you wouldn't rejoin him in the future? I cannot take that chance. Will you hold me prisoner forever? demanded Murtag, straightening. No, said Ajad. Only until you let yourself be examined. If you are found trustworthy, the twins will remove all knowledge of Father Duel's location from your mind before you leave. We won't risk something 
with those memories falling into Galbatorix's hand. What is it to be, Murtag? Decide quickly, or else the path will be chosen for you. Just give in, Aragon pleaded silently, concerned for Murtag's safety. It's not worth the fight. Finally, Murtag spoke, the words slow and distinct. My mind is the one sanctuary that has not been stolen from me. Men have tried to breach it before, but I've learned to defend it vigorously, for I am only safe with my innermost thoughts. You have asked for the one thing I cannot give, least of all to those two. He gestured at the twins. Do with me what you will, but know this. Death will take me before I'll expose myself to their probing. Admiration glinted in Ajihad's eyes. I'm not surprised by your choice, though I had hoped otherwise. Guards! The cedar door slammed open as warriors rushed in, weapons ready. Ajihad pointed at Murtag and commanded, Take him to the windowless room and bar the door securely. Post six men by the entrance and allow no one inside until I come to see him. Do not speak to him either. The warriors surrounded Murtag, watching him suspiciously. As they left the study, Aragon caught Murtag's attention and mouthed, I'm sorry. Murtag shrugged, then stared forward resolutely. He vanished into the hallway with the men. The sound of their feet faded into silence. Ajihad said abruptly, I want everyone out of this room but Aragon and Sephira now. Bowing, the twins departed, but Oryk said, Sir, the king will want to know of Murtag, and there will be the matter of my insubordination. Ajihad frowned and waved his hand. I will tell Hrothgar myself. As for your actions, wait outside until I call for you. And don't let the twins get away. I'm not done with them either. Very well, said Orc, inclining his head. He closed the door with a solid thump. After a long silence, Ajihad sat with a tired sigh. He ran a hand over his face and stared at the ceiling. Aragon waited impatiently for him to speak. When nothing was forthcoming, he blurted. Is Arya all right? Ajihad looked down at him and said gravely, No, but healers tell me she will recover. They worked on her all through the night. The poison took a dreadful toll on her. She wouldn't have lived if not for you. For that, you have the Varden's deepest thanks. Aragon's shoulders slumped with relief. For the first time, he felt their flight from Gilead had been worth the effort. So what now? he asked. I need you to tell me how you found Saphira and everything that's happened since, said Ajihad, forming a steeple with his fingers. Some of it I know from the message Brahm sent us, other parts from the twins. But I want to hear it from you, especially the details concerning Brahm's death. Aragon was reluctant to share his experiences with a stranger, but Ajihad was patient. Go on, urged Saphira gently. Aragon shifted, then began his story. It was awkward at first, but grew easier as he proceeded. Saphira helped him to remember things clearly with the occasional comments. Ajihad listened intently the entire time. Aragon talked for hours, often pausing between his words. He told Ajihad of Tirim, though he kept Angela's fortune-telling to himself, and how he and Brahm had found the Razak. He even related his dreams of Arya. When he came to Gilead and mentioned the shade, Ajihad's face hardened and he leaned back with veiled eyes. When his narrative was complete, Aragon fell silent, brooding on all that had occurred. Ajihad stood, clasped his hands behind his back, and absently studied one of the bookshelves. After a time, he returned to the desk. Brahm's death is a terrible loss. He was a close friend of mine and a powerful ally of the Varden. He saved us from destruction many times through his bravery and intelligence. Even now, when he has gone, he has provided us with one thing that can ensure our success. You. But what can you expect from me to accomplish? asked Aragon. I will explain it in full, said Ajihad. But there are more urgent matters to be dealt with first. The news of the Urgle's alliance with the Empire is extremely serious. If Galbatorx is gathering an Urgle army to destroy us, the Varden will be hard-pressed to survive, even though many of us are protected here in Farthendur. That a rider... Even one as evil as Galbatorix would consider a pact with such monsters is indeed proof of madness. I shudder to think that he promised them in return for their fickle loyalty. And then there is the Shade. Can you describe him? Aragon nodded. He was tall, thin, and very pale, with red eyes and hair. He was dressed in all black. What of his sword? Did you see it? asked Ajihad intentionally. Did it have a long scratch along the blade? Yes, said Aragon, surprised. How did you know? Because I put it there while trying to cut out his heart, said Ajihad with a grim smile. His name is Durza, one of the most vicious and cunning fiends to ever stalk this land. He is the perfect servant for Gavaltorix, and a dangerous enemy for us. You say that you killed him? How was it done? Aragon remembered it vividly. 
Murtag shot him twice. The first arrow caught him in the shoulder, and the second one struck him between the eyes. I was afraid of that, said Ajahn, frowning. You didn't kill him. Shades can only be destroyed by a thrust through the heart. Anything short of that will cause them to vanish and then reappear elsewhere in spirit form. It's an unpleasant process, but Durza will survive and return stronger than ever. A moody silence settled over them, like a foreboding thunderhead. Then Ajiad stated, You are an enigma, Aragon, a quandary, that no one knows how to solve. Everyone knows that the Varden want, or the Urgos, or even Galbatorix, but no one knows what you want. And that's what makes you dangerous, especially to Galbatorix. He fears you because he doesn't know what you will do next. Do the Varden fear me? asked Aragon. No, said Ajihad carefully. We are hopeful. But if that hope proves false, then yes, we will be afraid. Aragon looked down. You must understand the unusual nature of your position. There are factions who want you to serve their interests and no one else's. The moment you entered Farthendur, their influence and power began tugging on you. Including yours? asked Aragon. Ajihad chuckled. His eyes were sharp. Including mine. There are certain things you should know. First is how Severe's egg happened to appear in the spine. Did Brom ever tell you what was done with her egg after he brought it here? No, said Aragon, glancing at Saphira. She blinked and flicked her tongue at him. Ajihad tapped his desk before beginning. When Brom first brought the egg to the Varden, everyone was deeply interested in its fate. We had thought the dragons were exterminated. The dwarves were solely concerned with making sure that the future rider would be an ally, though some of them were opposed to having a new rider at all. While the elves in Varden had a more personal stake in the matter, the reason was simple enough. Throughout history, all the riders have either been elven or human, with the majority being elven. There had never been a dwarf rider. Because of Galbatorx's betrayals, the elves were reluctant to let any of the Varden handle the egg for the fear that the dragon inside would hatch for the human with similar instabilities. It was a challenging situation, as both sides wanted riders for their own. The dwarves only aggravated the problem by arguing obstinately with both elves and us whenever they had the chance. Tensions escalated, and before long, threats were made that were later regretted. It was then that Brahm suggested a compromise that allowed a side to save face. He proposed that the egg be ferried between the Varden and the elves every year. At each place, children would parade past it, and then the bearers of the egg would wait to see if the dragon would hatch. If it didn't, they would leave and return to the other group. But if the dragon did hatch, the new rider's training would be undertaken immediately. For the first year or so, he or she would be instructed here, by Brahm. Then the rider would be taken to the elves, who would finish the education. The elves reluctantly accepted this plan, but with the stipulation that if Brahm were to die before the dragon hatched, they would be free to train the new rider without interference. The agreement was slanted in their favor. Both knew that the dragon would likely choose an elf, but it provided a desperately needed semblance of equality. Ajihad paused, his rich eyes somber. Shadows bit into his face under his cheekbones, making them jut out. It was hoped that a new rider would bring our two races closer together. We waited for well over a decade, but the egg never hatched. The matter passed from our minds, and we rarely thought about it except to lament the egg's inactivity. Then, last year, we suffered a terrible loss. Arya and the egg disappeared on her return from Trojanheim to the elven city, Osalan. The elves were the first to discover she was missing. They found her steeds and guards slain in Dueldenvarden, and a group of slaughtered urgles nearby, but neither Arya nor the egg was there. When this news reached me, I feared that the urgles had both of them, and would soon learn the location of Father Duor and the elves' capital, Elismera, where their queen, Islandi, lives. Now I understand they were working for the Empire, which is far worse. We won't know exactly what occurred during the attack until Arya wakes, but I've deduced a few details from what you've said. Ajihad's vest rustled as he leaned his elbows on the desk. The attack must have been swift and decisive, else Arya would have escaped. Without any warning, and deprived of a place to hide, she could have done only one thing, use magic to transport the egg elsewhere. She can use magic? asked Aragon. Arya had mentioned that she had been given a drug to suppress her power. He wanted to confirm that she meant magic. He wondered if she could teach him more words of the ancient language. It was one of the reasons why she was chosen to guard the egg. Anyway, Arya couldn't have returned it to us. She was too far away. And the elves' realm is warded by arcane barriers that prevent anything from entering the borders through magical means. She must have thought of Brahm, and in desperation sent the egg toward Carvajal. Without time to prepare, I'm not surprised she missed by the margin she did. The twins tell me that it's an imprecise art. Why was she closer to Palancar Valley than the Varden? asked Aragon. Where do the elves really live? Where is this Elismira? 
Ajihad's keen gaze bored in Aragon as he considered the question. I do not tell you this lightly, for the elves guard their knowledge jealously. But you should know, and I do this as a display of trust. Their cities lie far to the north, in the deepest regions of the endless forest do weld in Varden. Not since the rider's time has any one dwarf or human been elf friend enough to walk in their leafy halls. I do not know how to find Elismir. As for Ocelon, based on where Arya disappeared, I suspect it is near Duelden Varden's western edge towards Carvajal. You must have many other questions, but bear with me and keep them until I have finished. He gathered his memories, then spoke in a quick pace. When Arya disappeared, the elves withdrew their support from the Varden. Queen Islandi was especially enraged and refused any contact with us. As a result, even though I received Brahm's message, the elves were st are still ignorant of you and Saphira. Without their supplies to sustain my troops, we have fared badly these past months in skirmishes with the Empire. With Arya's return and your arrival, I expect the Queen's hostility to will abate. The fact that you rescued Arya will greatly help our case with her. Your training, however, is going to present a problem for both Varden and elves. Brom obviously had a chance to teach you, but we need to know how thorough he was. For that reason, you will be tested to determine the extent of your abilities. Also, the elves will expect you to finish the training with them, though I'm not sure if there's time for that. Why not? asked Aragon. For several reasons. Chief among them, the tidings you brought about the Urgles, said Ajihad, his eyes strained to Severe. You see, Aragon, the Varden are in an extremely delicate position. On one hand, we have to comply with the elves' wishes if we want to keep them as allies. At the same time, we cannot anger the dwarves if we wish to lodge in Trojanheim. Aren't the dwarves part of the Varden? asked Aragon. Ajihad hesitated. In a sense, yes. They allow us to live here and provide assistance in our struggle against the Empire. But they are loyal only to their king. I have no power over them except for what Harathgar gives me. And even he often has trouble with the dwarf clans. The thirteen clans are subservient to Harathgar. But each clan chief wields enormous power. They choose the new dwarf king when the old one dies. Rothgar is sympathetic to our cause, but many of the chiefs aren't. He can't afford to anger them unnecessarily, or he'll lose the support of his people. So, his actions on our behalf have been severely circumscribed. These clan chiefs, said Aragon, are they against me as well? Even more so, I'm afraid, said Ajihad wearily. There has been long been enmity between dwarves and dragons. Before the elves came and made peace, dragons made a regular habit of eating the dwarves' flocks and stealing their gold. And the dwarves are slow to forget past wrongs. Indeed, they never fully accepted the riders or allowed them to police their kingdom. Galbatorx's rise to power has only served to convince many of them that it would be better never to deal with riders or dragons ever again. He directed his last words at Saphira. Aragon said slowly, Why doesn't Galbatorx know where Farthendur and Elasmira are? Surely he was told of them when he was instructed by the riders. Told of them? Yes. Shown where they are? No. It's one thing to know that Farthendur lies within these mountains, quite another thing to find it. Galbatorx hadn't been taken to either place before his dragon was killed. After that, of course, the riders didn't trust him. He tried to force the information out of several riders during his rebellion, but they chose to die rather than to reveal it to him. As for the dwarves, he's never managed to capture one alive, though it's only a matter of time. Then why doesn't he just take an army and march through Duweldenvarden until he finds Elismira? asked Aragon. Because the elves still have enough power to resist him, said Ajad. He doesn't dare test his strength against theirs. At least not yet, but his cursed sorcery grows stronger each year. With another rider at his side, he would be unstoppable. He keeps trying to get one of the two, his two eggs to hatch, but so far he's been unsuccessful. Aragon was puzzled. How can his power be increasing? The strength of his, of his body limits his abilities. It can't build itself up forever. We don't know, said Ajihad, shrugging with his broad shoulders, and neither do the elves. We can only hope that someday he will be destroyed by one of his own spells. He reached inside his vest and somberly pulled out a battered piece of parchment. Do you know what this is? He asked, placing it on the desk. Aragon bent forward and examined it. Lines of black script written in an Anglian language were inked across the page. Large sections of the writing have been destroyed by blots of blood. One edge of the parchment was charred. He shook his head. No, I don't. It was taken from the leader of the Urgle host we destroyed last night. It cost us twelve men to do so. They sacrificed themselves that you might escape safely. The writing is the king's invention, a script he uses to communicate with his servants. It took me a while, but I was able to devise its meaning, at least where it's legible. It reads, Gatekeeper at Ithrojada is to let this bearer and his minions pass. There are to be bunked with a they are to be bunked with the others of their kind, and by only two of the factions refrain from fighting. 
Command will be given under Tarak, under Gaj, under Durza, under Ushnark the Mighty. Ushnark is Galbatorx. It means father in the Urgo tongue, an affectation that pleases him. Find what they are suitable for and the footmen and are to be kept separate. No weapons are to be distributed until for marching. Nothing else can be read past there, except a few vague words, said Ajihad. Where's Ithro Jada? I've never heard of it. Nor have I, confirmed Ajihad. Which makes me suspect that Galbatorx has renamed an existing place for his own purpose. After deciphering this, I asked myself what hundreds of Urgles were doing by the Bayor Mountains where you first saw them and where they were going. The parchment mentions others of their kind, so I assume there are even more Urgles at their destination. There's only one reason the king would gather such a force, to forge a bastard army of humans and monsters to destroy us. For now, there is nothing to do but wait and watch. Without further information, we cannot find this Ithro Jada. Still, Farthendur has not yet been discovered, so there is hope. The only Urgles to have seen it died last night. How did you know we were coming? asked Aragon. One of the twins was waiting for us, and there was an ambush in place for the coal. He was aware of Sephira listening intently, though she kept her own counsel. He knew she would have things to say later. We have sentinels placed at the entrance of the valley you traveled through. On either side of the Beartooth River, they sent us a dove to warn us, explained Ajihad. Aragon wondered if that was the same bird that Sevira had tried to eat. When the egg and Arya disappeared, did you tell Brom? He said he hadn't heard anything from the Varden. We tried to alert him, said Ajihad, but I suspect our men were intercepted and killed by the Empire. Why else would the Razak have gone to Carvajal? After that, Brom was traveling with you, and it was impossible to get word to him. I was relieved when he contacted me via messenger at, from Tirim. It didn't surprise me that he went to Jaod. They were old friends, and Jaod could easily send us a message because he smuggled supplies to us through Serta. All of this raised serious questions. How did the Empire know where to ambush Arya and later our messengers to Carvajal? How has Garbatorix learned which merchants to help the Varden? Jaod's business has been virtually destroyed since you left him as have those of other merchants who supported us. Every time one of their ships sets sail, it disappears. The dwarves cannot give us everything we need, so the Varden are in a desperate need of supplies. I'm afraid that we have a traitor, or traitors, in our midst, despite our efforts to examine people's minds for deceit. Aragon sank deep in thought, pondering what he had learned. Ajihad waited calmly for him to speak. Undisturbed by the silence, for the first time since finding Saphira's egg, Aragon felt that he understood what was going on around him. At last he knew where Saphira came from and what might lie in his future. What do you want from me? he asked. How do you mean? I mean, what is expected of me in Trojanheim? You and the elves have a plan for me. But what if I don't like them? A hard note crept in his voice. I'll fight when needed, revel when there's occasion, mourn when there is grief, and die if my time comes. But I won't let anyone use me against my will. He paused to let the words sink in. The writers of the old were arbiters of justice and beyond the leader of their time. I don't claim that position. I doubt people would accept such oversight when they've been free of it all their lives, especially from one as young as me. But I do have power, and I will wield it as I see fit. What I want to know is how you plan to use me. Then I will decide whether to agree to it. Ajihad looked at him wryly. If you were anyone else and you were before another leader, you would most likely be killed for that insolent speech. What makes you think I will expose my plans just because you demand it? Aragon flushed but did not lower his gaze. Still, you are right. Your position gives you the privilege to say such things. You cannot escape the politics of your situation. You will be influenced, one way or another. I do not want to see you become a pawn of any one group or purpose any more than you do. You must retain your freedom for it lies your true power, the ability to make choices independent of any leader or king. My own authority will be limited, but I believe it's for the best. The difficulty lies in making sure that those with power include you in their deliberations. Also, despite your protest, the people here have a certain expectation of you. They are going to bring you their problems, no matter how petty, and demand that you solve them. Ajihad leaned forward, his voice deadly serious. There will be cases where someone's future will rest in your hands. With a word, you can send them careening into happiness or misery. Young women will seek your opinion on whom they should marry. Many will pursue you as a husband, and old men will ask which of their children should receive inheritance. You must be kind and wise with them all, for they will put their trust in you. Don't speak flippantly or without thought, because your words will have impact far beyond what you intend. Ajihad leaned back, his eyes hooded. 
The burden of leadership is being responsible for the well-being of the people in your charge. I have dealt with it from day one. I was chosen as the head of the Varden, and now you must as well. Be careful. I won't tolerate injustice under my command. Don't worry about your youth and inexperience. They will pass soon enough. Aragon was uncomfortable with the idea of people asking him for advice. But you still haven't said what I'm to do here. For now, you're covered over 130 leagues in eight days. A feat to be proud of. I'm sure that you'll appreciate the rest. When you've recovered, we will test your competency in arms and magic. After that, well, I will explain your options, and then we will have to decide the course. And what about Murtag? asked Aragon bitingly. Ajihad's face darkened. He reached beneath his desk and lifted up Zarak. The sword's polished sheath gleamed in the light. Ajihad slid his hand over it, lingering in the etched sigil. He will stay here until he allows the twins into his mind. You can't imprison him, argued Aragon. He's committed no crime. We can't give him his freedom without being sure that he won't turn against us. Innocent or not, he's potentially a danger to us, as his father was, said Ajihad with a hint of sadness. Aragon realized that Ajihad would not be convinced otherwise, and his concern was valid. How were you able to recognize his voice? I met his father once, said Ajihad shortly. He tapped Zarak's hilt. I wish Brahm had told me he had taken Morzan's sword. I suggest that you don't carry it within Farthendur. Many here remember Morzan's time with hate, especially the dwarves. I'll remember that, promised Aragon. Ajihad handed Zarak to him. That reminds me. I have Brahm's ring, which he sent as confirmation of his identity. I was keeping it for when he returned to Trojanheim. Now that he's dead, I suppose it belongs to you. I think that he would have wanted you to have it. He opened the desk drawer and took the ring from it. Aragon accepted it with reverence. The symbol cut into the face of Sapphire was identical to the tattoo on Arya's shoulder. He could fit the ring on his index finger, admiring how it caught the light. I... I am honored, he said. Ajihad nodded gravely, then pushed back his chair and stood. He faced Saphira and spoke to her, his voice swelling in power. Do not think I have forgotten you, O oh mighty dragon. I have said these things as much for your benefit as for Aragon's. It is even more important that you know them, for to you falls the task of guarding him in these dangerous times. Do not underestimate your might, nor falter at his side, because without you he will surely fail. Saphira lowered her head until her eyes were level and stared at him through slitted black pupils. They examined each other silently, neither of them blinking. Ajihad was the first to move. He lowered his eyes and said softly, It is indeed a privilege to meet you. He'll do, said Saphira respectfully. She swung her head to face Aragon. Tell him that I am impressed, both with Trojanheim and with him. The Empire is right to fear him. Let him know, however, that if he had decided to kill you, I would have destroyed Trojanheim and torn him apart with my teeth. Aragon hesitated, surprised by the venom in her voice. Then he relayed the message. Ajihad looked at her seriously. I, want to, I would expect nothing else from one so noble. But I doubt you could have gotten past the twins. Saphir snorted with derision. Bah. Knowing what she meant, Aragon said, They must be stronger than they appear. I think they'd be sorely dismayed if they ever faced a dragon's wrath. The two of them might be able to defeat me, but never Saphira. You should know, a rider's dragon strengthens his magic beyond what is a normal magician might have. Brom was always weaker than me because of that. I think that in the absence of the riders, the twins have overestimated their power. Ajihad looked troubled. Brom was considered one of our strongest spell weavers. Only the elves surpassed him. If what you say is true, we will have to reconsider a great many things. He bowed to Saphira. As it is, I am glad that it wasn't necessary to harm either of you. Saphira dipped her head in return. Ajihad straightened with a lordly air and called, Auric! The dwarf hurried into the room and stood before the desk, crossing his arms. Ajihad frowned at him, irritated. You caused me a great deal of trouble, Auric. I have had to listen to one of the twins complain all morning about your insubordination. They won't let me rest until you are punished. Unfortunately, they're right. It's a serious matter that cannot be ignored, and accounting is due. Auric's eyes flicked toward Aragon, but his face betrayed no emotion. He spoke quickly in rough tones. The coal were almost around Costa Mirna. They were shooting arrows at the dragon, Aragon and Murtag, but the twins did nothing to stop it, like Shavlan. They refused to open the gates, even though we could see Aragon shouting and shouting the opening phrase on the other side of the waterfall. They refused to take action when Aragon did not rise from the water. Perhaps I did wrong, but I couldn't let a rider die. I wasn't strong enough to get out of the water myself, offered Aragon. I would have drowned if he hadn't pulled me out. 
Hajihad glanced at him and then asked Oryk seriously, And later, why did you oppose them? Oryk raised his chin defiantly. It wasn't right for them to force their way into Murtag's mind, but I wouldn't have stopped them if I'd known who he was. No, you did the right thing, though it would be simpler if you hadn't. It isn't our place to force our way into people's minds, no matter who they are. Hajihad fingered his dense beard. Your actions were honorable, but you did defy a direct order from your commander. The penalty for that has always been death. Oryx's back stiffened. You can't kill him for that. He was only helping me, cried Aragon. It isn't your place to interfere, said Ajiad sternly. Oryx broke the law and must suffer the consequences. Aragon started to argue again, but Ajihad stopped him with a raised hand. But you are right. The sentence will be mitigated because of the circumstances. As of now, Oryx, you are removed from your active service and forbidden to engage in any military activities under my control. Do you understand? Oryx's face darkened. Then he looked confused. He nodded sharply. Yes. Furthermore, in the absence of your regular duties, I appoint you to Aragon and Saphira's guide for the duration of their stay. You are to make sure they receive every comfort and amenity you would have to offer. Saphira will stay above Isidar Mithrum. Aragon will have quarters wherever he wants. When he recovers from his trip, take him to the training fields. They're expecting him, said Ajihad, a twinkle of amusement in his eye. Oryk bowed low. I understand. Very well. You all may go. Send the twins as you leave. Aragon bowed and began to leave. Where can I find Arya? I would like to see her. No one is allowed to visit her. You'll have to wait until she comes to you. Ajihad looked down at his desk in a clear dismissal.